It's great to welcome to the program today, Jack Stilgo, who is associate professor of science and technology studies at University College London, where he studies the development of new technologies in society. Uh, one of which, Jack, is, of course, uh, autonomous vehicles and and self-driving technology, where we've now seen um, a sort of longer period of testing of different types by different companies. We've also seen some tragic accidents, including um, uh, one, one particular story involving a, an Uber vehicle in the United States, which, of course, uh, we, we've spoken about. Let's maybe start generally when you look at the way in which self-driving autonomous vehicles are being tested today, concerned, pleased with the safety measures that are being taken? Um, well, um, thanks for having me, David. The, the first thing to say, I guess, is that is that testing on public roads of these new technologies is necessary to an extent because they simply will not be able to learn to drive purely in simulation or in test tracks. And so there will be this very difficult stage of engaging in a form of experiment in public using the roads as a laboratory of sorts. Getting that right is um, extremely tricky. I think at the moment I am concerned because I think we have a few players who see themselves as being in a sort of race to develop the technology first. And I think that uh, creates incentives towards recklessness, which I think um, bodes ill for the long-term success of the technology. And also, as we've seen, for, uh, for public safety. It may also force cities and planners and, and others into making bad decisions about the technology unless they're alert. So we had the March 2018 Uber incident where a pedestrian was killed in Arizona. It was a major, major story. But one of the other stories surrounding this is do we actually know the full extent of what has happened during testing? Because some pretty good investigative reporting is at least suggesting that there are tests going on sometimes with less than favorable results which we simply don't know about because it's not all being reported. It, do, do you believe that this is a concern and what do you know about it? Well, I think I think it is a concern. I think if if I'm right and this is a form of experiment and it's to an extent a necessary experiment that at some point these technologies will need to be tested in the real world, in the wild, as it were, then the question is, what does a good experiment look like? And I think one of the things, one of the, the first principles that we might apply to, to testing is at least for policymakers to be aware of what's going on. So at the moment, we have a situation where uh, each company is, in effect, learning from its own experiments. And I think that's not in the public interest. I think if we can find ways that companies can learn from one another, and that the public sector can learn from the private sector, and that's probably uh, the the better way to, to get good outcomes. What would you say are the key technological problems that need to be solved when it comes to the future of these types of self-driving autonomous vehicle, te vehicle technologies? Well, the I mean the reason why they need to be they need to be tested in the in the wild is that some of the problems that they will encounter will be surprising ones. So in terms of the develop the necessary development of the technology, I mean, we shouldn't forget that this technology is widely regarded as possible until relatively recently. And the reason why it is now seen as likely that we will have, you know, self-driving cars on our streets um, or on the streets of some places within uh, within years is that there have been dramatic improvements in in machine learning which basically reduces the problem of driving to one of uh, image recognition, uh, prediction and planning. So can can the sensors on the car recognize the world around the, around it, work out what bits of that world are going to do next and then plan a, uh, a safe route? The technological challenge there is absolutely vast. And in some places where it's being where it's being tested, um, the technology um, uh, needs to improve uh, only incrementally because those places are relatively straightforward places. And you could say, you know, there's a reason why they're being tested in, in, in Tempe, Arizona, for example, because Tempe 
um, is a relatively well organized city. I'm here in central London. The prospect of a self-driving car being able to navigate its way from one corner of central London to the other anytime soon is is far harder to imagine. Yeah, even here in Boston, which is generally speaking a, a more London like city in terms of the arrangement of the streets, the testing is almost exclusively happening in what we call the uh, seaport area, which is much more like Tempe that, than, than it is like London. So that seems to be one issue. Another one that comes up often is a sort of version of the the infamous trolley problem, the idea of imagine a self-driving vehicle um, hurtling towards a, um, a, 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 a crosswalk, for example, where mm. pedestrians have entered and now the vehicle has to sort of make a decision as to whether it runs over five people in the crosswalk or drives onto a sidewalk and maybe only hits one person, but it's one person who is uh, where cars are not supposed to be. Is that yeah. actually a, an, an issue that is going to be a complicated one to solve or, or is that not really one of the primary problems that you identify in the way that the configuration and algorithms will be will be configured? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the trolley problem is a distraction. Mm. I think the trolley problem, you know, we should remember the origins of that, which is as a thought experiment in applied ethics designed to demonstrate the uh, the insolubility of a particular ethical dilemma. Right. There is no there is no ideal way to, um, to, to make a choice in that uh, example. Applying it to self-driving cars seems sort of interesting in a dinner party discussion type way. In policy terms, it's irrelevant. Um, we, it does the technology too much credit. It presumes that the technology is going to be able to be omniscient and able to make calculations about numbers of people and, and, and um, it also presumes something rather troubling that we would want a technology to make judgments among types of people. Um, but I think thinking through it and regarding it as a thought experiment, which is its proper status, we should take that and use it as a way to, to think about, well, there will be some ethical dilemmas. I mean, the Uber crash has already revealed a real ethical dilemma in technology design which is the extent to which engineers balance uh, so-called false positives against false negatives in the way that they calibrate their algorithms so that they don't get too jittery uh, when there is something fairly harmless in their way, um, but that they, uh, that they do spot something important and recognize that it's something important when that thing uh, poses, a, poses a hazard. Uber got that. Uh, very publicly wrong in the in 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 March. In that case, that's a very real ethical choice, and it's that concerned about rather than uh, a trolley problem, which also you know suggests that the morality here, the responsibility, sits inside the machine rather than with the designers and the developers of the machine. Yeah, I mean, I think you could still say, of course, it's ultimately how the vehicle is programmed by the developers and argue that it's it's still a question, but just one that that the developers have to solve. But if we zoom out a, a little bit, are you generally optimistic that these problems are going to be solved and that this is going to be a growing technology, sort of a growing reality of uh, 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 motor vehicles in the world? Or do you think that there's a chance that this doesn't happen? So I think, I mean, something, something will happen, right? I mean, I, so I'm a, I'm a social scientist. I don't make predictions about technology, except that what I, I can see here, is there is too much money being invested for nothing to happen. Hmm. So I think there are interesting questions that, that relate less to when will this happen and more to where it will happen. I think, you know, as we've discussed, some places like Tempe, Arizona might be easy wins for the industry. It might be far harder to see these things driving around, you know, downtown Boston or, or Manhattan or, or Rome or, or New Delhi anytime soon. Um, but I think there's something else that isn't being talked about, which is the question of what would it actually take to realize the benefits that are being suggested here. And there, I think we're only hearing half a story at the moment. And you can imagine actually that if you wanted to realize the benefits of self-driving cars, you would do some of the things that town planners did with the arrival of the motor car. 
the, in the early 20th century, which was to say, OK, here's a beneficial technology. In order to make this safer, we need to clear other people off the streets. Um, it's not normally talked about by self-driving car developers, but actually one way in which you could make the system much more controllable is by getting cars to talk to each other and to infrastructure and by segregating self-driving cars into their into their own lanes. It makes a, for a much more controlled system and a much more a much easier engineering challenge. Yeah. And that gets to what some uh, believe will be really the danger, which is not the eventual end point where most or all cars are autonomous and they're interconnected, but this intermediate or transitionary phase where you have human drivers who now have to share the road with autonomous vehicles. And of course, the autonomous vehicles who have to share the road with the human drivers. Is, is that transition period an, an area of significant um, attention required? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the transition period could be never ending. I mean, it, it's relatively easy to imagine a world in which there are only self-driving cars. Yes. That it's much harder to imagine the mixed world. But we shouldn't forget that, you know, we still haven't fully realized the transition from horses to motor cars. There are still horses trotting around on American and, and, and British roads. So those mixed systems happen, and we've introduced now other vehicles onto onto uh, our roads: scooters, uh, bicycles, various other forms of of, of mobility. Um, that transition will be difficult, and in that difficulty, um, policymakers will be faced with some really difficult choices. So when American cities chose, in effect, to privilege the motor car over other forms of transport. Um, that had real effects on pedestrians. It had real effects on public transit in the US, uh, which in some places has never quite recovered. Um, I mean, it's slightly easier here in here in London because London is a city that predates the motor car. So there will there are still lots of parts of London in which it is really, really hard to drive and much easier to to walk around. But for policymakers, they're faced with some very difficult choices about how to manage that transition. Jack, in the limited time we have left, is there an income inequality angle to uh, the development of autonomous vehicle technology? So uh, that's a great question. And it's one that not enough people are asking the question in effect of who who is likely actually to benefit from this technology. So before the technology is really tried out, it's very easy to for the developers to say here is a technology that is going to be emancipatory it's going to allow people who maybe can't afford a car or can't drive a car because they are too young too old maybe they're disabled maybe they're blind um, and it's going to open up uh, mobility to those groups and it's very easy to make those sorts of emancipatory claims um, i would worry though that the development of this technology will be likely to just follow the money, right? So it, it is likely to be a technology that is used by rich people to do rich people's things in rich places. And if we are serious about you know, even the safety claims being made for the, for the technology, um, a million, more than a million people a, di a year die every, uh, uh, die in, in, in car crashes. And most of those people are dying in the poorest places in the world. Do we really expect that a self-driving car is going to be deployed in those places and able to tackle that problem? Well, I, I fear not. So I think the sooner we ask the question, who is likely to benefit, the, the better we can make the decisions about the technology. Yeah, extraordinarily important angle and one that we think about a lot when we talk about CRISPR and genetic editing technologies. Uh, very, very similar analysis exists there. Uh, we've yeah. been speaking with Jack Stilgo, who's associate professor of science and technology studies at University College London. Uh, Jack, really a pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here.